everyone, it's Dr. D from Teacher Prep Tech. This video, we're going to be looking at a professional development that I'm with Dr. Nate Sweat from University of San Diego, and we're showing how to use HyperDocs in the digital classroom. But whether you're teaching remotely or not, HyperDocs are wonderful digital documents or slides that you share with your students, and it promotes self-directed learning. So I hope you find this PD valuable. Don't forget to hit the subscribe button and you will get this slide deck and all the other resources that we're sharing here on Teacher Prep. Thanks so much and have a great day. Hey everyone, I'm Patricia Dickinson and I'm an associate professor of teacher education at National University. I've been teaching online since 2010 and I was a former elementary, middle school, and math coach for the Los Angeles Unified School District. So my website is teacherpreptech.com and you can reach me at the Wired Professor, um, Twitter at Teacher Prep Tech, Instagram or Insta, as my son would say, at Teacher Prep Tech, and at LinkedIn with my real professional name, Patricia Dickinson. Give me a shout out. Okay, and then uh, again, I'm a adjunct professor consultant at Tech a uh, assistive technology, also called AT. Uh, I'm a formal special ed teacher and AT specialist. I work with multiple charter schools, uh, handle a major caseload of students with disabilities. I uh, just recently got my EDD in educational leadership at San Diego State. And you can email me at sweat at gmail.com or uh, my Twitter is at NateSweat without two T's. Uh, Instagram or LinkedIn as well. So feel free to hit us up on those um, about this uh, presentation. Uh, just today's learning objectives, uh, we hope to get some uh, ideas around how to curate digital content so students can uh, or are actively participating uh, online and the digital way in learning. And uh, also to try to focus on that being uh, that inquiry base and students that are teaching using multimedia. So that's kind of our focus of tonight. Uh, also within that, we're gonna talk about how to scaffold and differentiate different digital content. And also we really wanna kind of dive a little deeper within the methods of synchronous and asynchronous teaching online and how that looks and, and what's the pros and cons of some of those. And then the knowledge of basically some of the technical tools that are out there for instruction and distance learning. So. Hopefully you can go away today with some tools and some ideas around that implement into uh, lesson design and um, maybe even implement them into your classroom. I know most uh, all of us are probably on a break now, but uh, going into um, spring, uh, maybe we can incorporate some of these tools. All okay. right, so just to frame our conversation, I know you guys are all here tonight to learn about HyperDocs. But we also want to consider what are the theoretical um, underpinnings of HyperDocs and how does HyperDocs really support uh, working with diverse student populations in, in our classroom. So I know many of you might be teaching remotely. You might not have to, you know, the opportunity to get and meet with your kiddos and really know their learning style or, you know, how they process information. But what is beautiful about HyperDocs, it really works within the UDL framework. And if you're not familiar, maybe you are, maybe you can just put it in the chat if you're familiar with UDL. But that there are three primary no networks, uh, recognition, learning, strategic, and effective learning. So we're when we talk about learning, we're talking about how our brain processes information, how we make sense out of the information that we're learning. And for teachers, what do we need to know in terms of how we can represent engage our kids and give them opportunities to act and express um, what they're learning. So in terms of a framework, UDL is really a wonderful backbone that can support English language learners, students with special needs. Um, it provides a really good uh, solid ground in terms of thinking about how to design instruction. And you get the URL at the bottom if you're not familiar with UDL, definitely check out the CAST network. Okay. Do you want to go to the next slide, Nathan? All right. So in terms of the three principles of universal design for learning, let's check that out. 
You want to click and pop up. All right. All right. So we have our multiple means of representation. So for teachers, we want to think about how we represent information. So um, whether we're talking about a concept like decimals, and if we're representing it through a song, a video, through concrete manipulatives, through real world connections, how we represent the concepts and skills that we're trying to explicitly teach our students. The other principle that we want to take into consider is, click, click, multiple means of action and expression. So when we're designing learning experiences, how do we allow our students to express what they know? So tonight, Nathan invited you guys to a Flipgrid. That's one place where students can express what they know. Maybe they can uh, take that concept of decimals and express uh, their knowledge, or maybe they can express it through a Kahoot or Quizzy. So any ways that we, in, in terms of allowing our students to show us what they know and to act on it. And finally, the multiple means of engagement piece, and that's how we provide opportunities for our students to engage with learning. Now, if we're teaching online, that might be through you know, doing a Kahoot while you're in a live class, or maybe having the students use virtual manipulatives to engage with the concept of decimals. Maybe they're engaging by working with a partner or in a small group. So when we think about UDL, we want to make sure that we're hitting on all of these key ways to support our students in making sense of the content which Hyperdocs does an amazing job with. And when we start looking at that, I want you guys to just think about those three principles and how we're meeting all of those three principles in the design of a Hyperdoc. Um, so are, is everyone able to access the Google Slides? All right. Someone, uh, Jen said she can access them, needs access, but I have it set so everyone can access them. So I just want to make sure. I can put it back in the chat. Uh, it works now. Oh, okay, great. It, it told you. me can't access, can't access, can't access. And then, like the fourth time I refreshed the page, it said, Do you want to make a copy? Like, okay, okay. Yeah. And I, went, I went in the settings and it was, it was open. So I was, okay, good. All right, moving on. Sorry. Yeah. Okay. So I don't know if you want to add on to anything about UDL. I know that uh, it was originally from the CAS network. Yeah. So just a little bit. Um, I, I think uh, part of, and especially when we talk about digital um, curriculum and, and instruction too, is identify those barriers. So thinking um, when you're designing and slides and things, what are some of those barriers that students might interact that mm -hmm. come across that, that might be in that? So. That could be images, maybe not being clear, maybe language, um, really thinking about how to visualize those things or use different ways of representing those things. And uh, so using different tools uh, to show maybe a video compared to having maybe students have to do like a, uh, a response, a written response. Uh, maybe when you're giving feedback, you record yourself with a screencast. So there's a lot of things that you could do to kind of um, use the technology to really um, enhance UDL in your lesson design. So just think about those barriers that some of those students might have issues with or students are like, I don't understand. Maybe find a different what, another tool to maybe explain or give feedback um, or those things as well. Right. So there's a lot of different ways we can use UDL in the digital online platform as well. And I think what's great about HyperDocs is that you can build in a lot of those scaffolds that you might have in your classroom. So if you are working, say, with a concept like place value and having both those concrete tools as well as, you know, a place value chart, well, how do you do that online, right? So having a UDL approach and using digital tools like a HyperDoc format, you can build in those scaffolds so that students can choose what supports they need. So it's very dynamic. And then you have social emotional learning as an engagement factor. Absolutely, right. So that's SEL piece, which we know is strongly linked to engagement, um, which is it's often hard to to kind of be able to uh, to build that in an online learning space. 
But when we provide opportunities for our kids to engage with the content, engage with us and and make, uh, you know, meaningful connections, then that piece does, it does happen. Great. And yeah. it's a very good part. And we'll talk a little bit more about that as well. Right. All right. So multiple means of representations. This is the what of learning. We just kind of highlighted this, but if you want to go back and reference, what are some key things that you might want to include? Multiple examples, highlighting text, media and formats, background and content, context, excuse me. Obviously like tapping into our students' prior knowledge. All right. Okay, so let's get into why we're all here. So that was kind of the framework that you know we want to discuss. Agoras UDL is built into a lot of things that we do and we design um, as, le as lessons, uh, but HyperDocs is a great way to really think about it now, especially um, I've been teaching about this for a while, but now that we're in this digital format, how can we transform and enhance our instruction so that we're meeting our students needs and trying to um, kind of change our methodology around how we're teaching and implementing some of these technology tools. So a basic digital, uh, basic HyperDoc is any kind of digital document. Um, a lot of people use Google Docs just because a lot of us use Google Classroom for teaching. Um, it doesn't have to be a Google Doc, it could be a PDF. Uh, but basically the idea is kind of replacing that worksheet method. If you really think about the worksheets you probably have uh, delivering instruction, uh, instead of doing worksheets, you can really use this and, and transform that into more of a digital platform. And so what that uses is just different sorts of multimedia. So it's anything from images to videos to audio to text, anything that might help um, or navigate some students to, to maybe a tool or a video or YouTube video or anything that you maybe record that you want them to watch um, and linking things to them, making it more interactive. Okay, so that's just kind of the basic things. We're gonna dive deeper into what that looks like and what that means, all right? Uh, so there's two types of text sets. Um, these, per, these typically are not um, uh, hyperdocs per se. These are the, the backbone of hyperdocs. And basically all these are, are just ways to take a worksheet and kind of give students a little bit of information about certain things. Uh, one second. Thomas, can you take the dog? <laughs> um, sorry, he's, I know he's going to go crazy, he kind of gets crazy after he eats, but uh, one is that you see a, on the left is a, um, a table text set, so it's just a, a basic table with some links and some ways to respond to, so uh, a lot of people use a Google um, for this because it's a really great way to share it out to the class, have students edit it and make, you know, maybe copy it and then fill in the responses or a more of a game board um, template where there's kind of a array a around a certain subject where they can go and do some student choice where they can click on some links, explore, find out for information, and then in the middle usually is where they go and maybe uh, navigate somewhere to really do a discussion or do some kind of showing what they learn about. So this is kind of like a front-loading activity, very basic stuff, but these are one ways that you can incorporate hyperlinks within text sets. Um, and they're fundamental of hyperdocs. Do you want to add anything about that? No, I mean, I, I used both in my class and because um, I've taught math and science. So I predominantly use the table text for my science lessons. Um, and it's a great way for me to kind of also go in and see what my students are retaining from the, from whatever they're doing. Uh, typically we can watch a movie or watch a show, but we're not really assessing our students in ways. I've even added in like some front loading questions within the text, like watch the video and, you know, take notes of what you notice about different weather patterns or what have you. So there's different ways that you can also front load based on your learners in a table text set. And then the game board style, again, as you shared, it helps to gamify learning and kids really get into this. Um, I also sometimes use like an evidence page on the second part of a game board style so that if they go through each activity, I might say, okay, take a screenshot of, you know, your score while you played the base 10 game. Um, so that way I'm seeing some evidence that they've gone and done every single activity. 
And my students loved it. It was also a great way for me to differentiate instruction because as a math teacher, you know, you typically have kids that are all across the board. So I can add in, you know, based on where my students are at, some differentiated instruction as well. And I saw you use great things like in your instructions, you actually use a little screenshot of the, the fill tool. Mm -hmm. um, so that's what's really great about technology. You can really get those very precise things using screenshots or, or icons um, and things like that too, to really specify your instructions. And there's another UDL thing component right. to as well. Okay, so again, back to the game board, what that looks like, um, and this is the very basics, is they have linked images, um, and I'll show you that in a second. They have linked titles and resources, and then they might have a space for collaboration, and, and that's kind of what we're talking about, too. Um, so that students come in and just kind of click on the reflection part, we want to make sure they're going through some of these, and doing some of the learning. Uh, so there are ways to control that. Um, again. Um, there are some tricks and, and tips to these as well, but this is kind of the basic format, what it looks like. Um, a lot of people don't know, but you can link images with uh, URLs. If you click on the image like I have here, and then go, and this is in Google, uh, go to insert and then go to link, you can actually put a link on images. So a lot of people don't know you can link images because if you right click on the image, you won't get that feature. But if you click on the image and go up to insert, you can link it. So I want to make clear of that because a lot of people like, oh, I don't know how to link images. And so that's kind of a quick uh, tutorial on how to do it. Uh, also, if you struggle and you want to know how to do something, always use Google. That's why I always tell people, just type it in Google. Google will give you a response or, or YouTube video as well. So, um, so why, what's the difference between tech sets and hyperdocs is hyperdocs have more of a structure built into them. And that's kind of where we're going to kind of go real quick in, is the templates that hyperdocs provides. And so it's not just a game board or a quick little, you know, uh, front loading or, you know, maybe getting some prior knowledge built in. It's more of a structured activity. So it's basically a hierarchy of things where there's a progression of, of learning. So this is just a simple um, uh, template that they have on their website, and I have some screenshots of how to get there in a second, but basically taking the student through that process of learning. So that's the difference between just kind of a, a hyperdoc tech set to, uh, sorry, a, a hyperlink tech set to a hyperdoc actual, where we're actually designing, learning, and, and really incorporating some of those, those methodologies that we've learned in the classroom that we're taking basically our, our traditional style of teaching into more uh, digital platforms. Here's a fun thing that I actually did with uh, PE teachers is I took those that 5e template and uh, put QR codes on the left hand side because they were teaching outside. And so yeah. if you wanted to do something like a science exploration or something, you could take the tech outside, add the QR codes, and then if students are doing an investigation, they can just scan their phone over the QR code and pop up whatever information you want to share with them while they're you know, in that process. So it, it's, it's more than just a flat piece of paper and it does work if you print out too. <laughs> that's correct. And they do have virtual reality um, that's built into it as well. I'm oh, sorry, augmented reality, um, where they take the pictures and then it will actually augment over to uh, what, what they're doing too. So there's a lot of features uh, that you can do with QR codes, uh, especially like in Flipgrid and other things that you use. So some of those other tools that you embed into the, the HyperDoc to really kind of um, expand the learning, expand the experience, and things like that. So there's a lot of cool features that you can do. Uh, so quickly, we talked about a few. Um, we just mentioned uh, the five E's, Explore, Explain, the Workshop, and Hero Journey. So uh, on the HyperDogs website, they have these four templates. Uh, so depending on what content your area are, or what you're doing, or what you're designing, uh, might be different based on what you're doing. So just a quick uh, overview of these and we'll dive a little deeper in these, but just the explore, explain, apply is more the simple model. This is just kind of a explore, explain, apply, which is given and really gives this way to kind of for the students to get some learning. Um, this is very basic way of designing a hyperdoc, but this is a great starting point for you to start working on because it's not very complex. Uh, so basically giving them, so if it's in, um, you know, uh, math, we're going to give them some way to kind of go 
explore. So that's going to go watch a video. Maybe you give them a Khan Academy or some other kind of way to go explain, explore. They're going to come back and maybe do some kind of discussion or something where they explain what they did and then they're going to apply it. So then they're going to probably solve an equation or something like that. So there is, this is a very basic three-step process to a hybrid dog. Um, and on the slide, I have um, a picture of the, um, the template. And then on the right side is actually uh, some more resources around that. So if you want to more, know more, uh, you can click on that. It'll take you to another resource as well. Uh, the 5 E model is a more in depth, uh, of course, because we have the evaluation at the end. Um, this is the more model I like when I'm teaching, I like these students use because it's a little bit more in depth. Um, so it has the same elements as the first uh, model, but it goes a little bit deeper. It um, actually has them elaborate. So it really um, takes that learning and makes it extending the learning. So they're actually sharing and putting in their own words. And then there's a way to evaluate either that's a reflection or meeting with students one-on-one, -on -one, uh, things like that. So uh, very similar, just a little bit more in depth, a little bit more steps involved as well. So this can be a little bit more complicated uh, process, a little bit more time consuming as well, picking those tools and making sure that you're hitting all these different areas. The workshop model is more a um, way to kind of create a mini lesson. Uh, it could be a lot of different ways that you can incorporate the workshop model, uh, but basically really kind of giving them that uh, uh, front loading, uh, going into you know ways to kind of give them ways to learn about, about the information or the content, and then give them some kind of activity, some kind of engagement. Maybe uh, they meet together, they talk about it, uh, maybe they do a Padlet, uh, maybe they do anything collaborative where they're engaging with each other on what they've learned. And then they go to an independent application. So this could be anything to show what they learn. Uh, it could be a video, it could be notebooks, whatever you have your students doing. So some of the stuff that you're already doing online, you could take and put in some of these models um, and think about how you can really enhance your learning, your teaching and, and the learning that your students are doing. And then again, at the very end, they're going to share out. So they're going to do maybe something where they're all uh, sharing what they learned, what they did. Uh, so those are ways that you can do that. And again, there you can create uh, ways to do groupings, a uh, lot of ways to kind of create uh, different types of work and how you create those, those things. So this is kind of gives you a very basic template to really incorporate some of these um, uh, hyperdocs as well. And then the last one, it's more for uh, uh, literature and English major or English teachers uh, is a hero's journey. It's basically uh, some of the steps and the phases that uh, a character goes through, a plot um, develop, you know, the flight develops, how it goes through. So this could be another way that you can think about um, using hyperdocs as well. So there's different ways you go in there. So depending on what you're teaching, what you're doing, I would suggest going and, and kind of exploring these um, these different templates that they have and really using them. Um, so based on what you're teaching, your content area, uh, of course, it's going to change or what you're doing or, or however you are, uh, you're doing your lesson design uh, would fit basically on what template you need. All right. So how to get started. Um, so what I would suggest is go make a copy, go to the, the HyperDocs uh, website and get the template and just play around with it. Um, you know, take a, maybe a small lesson that you have, a mini lesson. I would try to try to do a whole unit at first, but just kind of work on incorporating something that could uh, really benefit your students. Uh, if it's a simple, um, you know, read and share where they're just reading uh, a short passage and you may have them go watch a video about it and then read it and then come together and talk about it, something like that. It could be as simple as that. Um, so I would recommend baby steps at first. Don't try to take off the whole enchilada, you know, work on this and get used to it because it, it, it can be complex and we're gonna show you how complex it could be in a second. Another way you could do is they have samples of HyperDocs. So HyperDocs is a free resource, teachers share resources. There's tons of different content areas that you can go and explore. Take one of those, copy it, and remix it. Put things, put your own links in there. Um, you know, change colors. You know, whatever you want to do. Um, so there's a there's another way you can do that. So you have something already created. So you're not creating a new from scratch uh, hyperdocs. 
And then start incorporating, I would recommend start incorporating multimedia links into your slides, like I am tonight, where I have embedded links into my pictures and things just to make it more dynamic, not as stagnant, just a slide. We're going to talk about this. Give them the way to go and learn further. Find, find ways that they can go and incorporate these things. So uh, you can do that for images, icons, all kinds of ways that you can incorporate multimedia into your slideshows. So to get those, um, the HyperDocs website, uh, they just updated it recently, so there's a lot of information. Um, but under the Find tab, we'll find templates and samples. So that's where you will find those that I just, just discussed, those templates um, that have those structures. Uh, and then the samples are, they are actually samples of actual um, HyperDocs. So go in there, play around, um, explore with some of those uh, samples that are built in there. Uh, feel free to take those. Those are free resources, so feel free to take those and edit them in any way as well. The other cool thing that uh, that they have. Uh, oh, sorry, you added this slide. <laughs> so we got some we got some examples to show you. So we've been talking about HyperDocs. We want to now show you what that looks like and how that can maybe look across different platforms and through different uh, content areas as well. Right. So uh, just to piggyback on what Nate said, all the resources and documents are free they've made available on teacher give teachers and on the hyperdoc site so some additional examples here that are hyperlinked to this presentation i just thought we'd uh walk through and then the folder at the top if you click on that that is a link to all of my resources for science so you're going to get a ton of different examples uh from google slides to game boards to the five e's all across the gamut. So those are all hyperlinked into the slide deck for you guys to take. Um, what any questions so far? I know we've covered quite a lot of information, but as you can see, just in terms of the language and the information, how it's disaggregated for the students so that they can make sense of the content, interact using games, um, you know, virtual tours, things like that, just for them to explore and to come back and report and to process. I think the big key thing here, especially when we talk about you know, universal design is, is really giving students an opportunity to process the information and to make sense out of what they're learning. And it's interesting, I most recently read an article that, you know, there hasn't been a huge shift in terms of students, students with special needs, in terms of their academic achievement. So um, I think, and I've talked to quite a few teachers of in special education that they've seen that this has really been a positive time for the kids. They love working with the technology. They get to work in a small group. There's not the anxiety of you know, being in a large class size and you know, not being the one that doesn't get it right away because they will get it, but they just need more time to process. And so these particular approaches really give our students the opportunity to do that, especially our second language learners as well. So click through that. Um, Nathan, you want to keep going? Yep. Um, also want to add a student choice as well. You know, that's another big factor is giving students the choice of what they want to click on to learn. So uh, I also suggest maybe if you're going to create a HyperDocs, make sure there's different choices and different um, levels. So think about all your students as well when you're designing these as well. Um, question that Sarah uh, Swar uh, Sora, I don't know if I pronounced your name right, uh, but I did create these uh, slides in Google Slides. And what I did is I used screenshots. I hyperlinked them. Uh, we used images, uh, did all kinds of things to um, make it more dynamic rather than just text-based bullet points. And this is another way to really kind of enhance your presentations um, for your students and give them a more dynamic presentation rather than just kind of a stagnant slide with text. Uh, especially for uh, UDL and English language learners, we really want to enhance that uh, environment. And even though we're online, we can still do that. But we have examples of that coming up real soon as well. So this is a teacher that I know online. I don't know her personally, um, <laughs> but she has some cool slides here. Um, she is really creative with what she did. So she really created a virtual classroom black backdrop and then put um, links on top of that. So the BCom carry on, if you click on that, 
Um, it will navigate you back to, um, oh, I'm in the Lexan, it probably won't work. Let's see. Right. It just can takes... you see my, can you see the, let's see. Oh, wait, it's, it's, yeah, it's there. Maybe just preview it for now. There you go. Yeah, just quick preview. So just, she linked the icon with a way to kind of go in and a Zen-like thing where students can come and go and relax. Uh, so all these, um, I can really start now. Yeah. Let me close these calming tabs. <laughs> so we can remain so calm. All, yeah, so all these um, icons in here, she has links. So if you hover over them, uh, usually it kind of pops up. Do you want to go back into presentation mode, Nathan? Yeah, maybe that will help. Um, so all these uh, links, she has she has a whole resource wall over here on the left uh, that she's linked uh, different things to. So giving the students a lot of visual information, but also, um, you know, ways to kind of make it more realistic, like you would be in the classroom. So really great creativity on this. So this is the one way you can kind of think about as an advanced way of doing a hyperdoc, um, where you're giving students choice. And then if you kind of, this is, it's a very short, it's a unit review she's doing. Uh, she has a template where you can insert your own video. And then at the bottom corner, she has um, these little icons and she's following the same um, template we talked about, but she, instead of making it in little boxes, she's actually made it a little tiny icon at the bottom. So students go and click on the engage. Uh, they click on the explore. Uh, they click on the explain. So the button is always consistent to the bottom corner. So students kind of get that um, repetitive way of, of where it is, where where they have to go. Uh, but you see she's kind of using this backdrop as a great virtual platform uh, to really enhance the way that um, students learn, the visualization of it, and really kind of talking about it. So even like on our desk, just Schoolology, which is their learning management system, if you click on that, it'll take them to the learning management system. So it has all the information they might need on here. And then she's got instructions, and rules. So really great comprehensive ways of teaching online. Yeah, I clicked on the numerated denominator and it goes right to vocabulary with, um, you know, so even just to that small nuance of unpacking the language. And it says closed cabin done. So like this is really great instructions, clear, you know, you know and it, it takes me back to the presentation. It's probably not going to do it now because I'm in full screen. Um, but those kind of things are really important when you're designing uh, hyperdocs. Is the instruction thinking about being a student, put yourself in the student um, perspective and making sure that we're designing it so that it's not complicated. Um, so this is a great example of what a hyperdoc could look like. Okay. So again, uh, you know, applies the bottom, you know, just different things that she's putting in here and really using a lot of great visuals as well. Yeah, the uh, the rabbit one is really cute. It goes through all the terms and all of the terms are also hyperlinked so that you can, in terms of SEL, the students can self-regulate to make sure that they went through all the terminology. And even just this scene, I don't know, if, I don't know about you, Nate, but for me, when I see this backdrop, I'm like, oh, wow, I feel like a little bit of mindfulness. I yeah. love the imagery. You know, I don't know this teacher, but I want to like hang out with her. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> And that's important. I mean, in a virtual um, environment, we have to connect students. We have to make that engagement. And this is really engaging, even with what she's doing here and giving her instructions. And, and like you said earlier, you know, she's saying after, after the instruction at the bottom, she says at the study jam video, she says after the video, do the do the test, take a screenshot and submit it in Schoolology. So she's actually monitoring the progress, making them do certain things, but she's giving instructions about how to do that. So. It's really great what she's doing. So just a great example of how you can transform a hyperdoc into more of a really great way of making a on a digital platform, not just a basic slideshow. Right. I think it's a, a less overwhelming too than, you know, if you have kids that might have processing issues, to see so much on one particular doc document can be overwhelming. But if it's broken up, like how she's done here into in one individual slide. It just feels a little bit more approachable and calming. So you always want to think about your learners and what would best suit their needs. 
I, and this is her last slide, just more information. So if you want to, you know, kind of look at this as an example, it's a great way to look at it, um, but really cool how she'd really kind of incorporated different imagery into hers, or her hyperdocs, uh, and being very consistent mm -hmm. um, with that. So just giving instructions and, you know, being fun and, uh, you know, kids love all this. This is great for uh, some teachers to really see this and see how it can be done in a fun uh, virtual way. And I think the key piece here too is is in terms of, and you talked about this, but the level of cognitive demand increases as the students progress through the hyperdoc. So you've given them some foundational skills, you've given them a chance to review, to practice, to see it. And now at the end, we're getting them to actually apply or transfer or create. So those more higher level blooms taxonomy um, and giving them choice, which is always super powering especially during this time of COVID where kids feel pretty powerless, it's really important to have choice and voice in the classroom. Okay, so that's her little, that's a little good example of a high level hyperdoc. So you can see kind of where it goes. And uh, this is another example that you uh, added as well, right? Yeah, so this is another teacher who's actually created an entire uh, digital document of math terminology for her grade. And so just like a Google slide deck, it's instead of being in horizontal, it's in vertical format, just like a notebook. And so these are just two screenshots. If you guys click on the blue on the left side of the link, you'll get access to this uh, digital vocabulary book, which you could pretty much adapt for any subject. And it's just a great reference guide for your students. Maybe they're working independently on a quiz or, you know, working on a Jamboard, another tool to give them access to the content that they need um, in real time. And then finally, I'm a big fan of virtual manipulatives. So having <laughs> access, having like a math teacher. <laughs> yeah, I just I love it. And so um, talk about choice, right? There's so much choice here in so many different ways they can express their knowledge about a variety of math concepts with this Google slide deck, which is just a bookshelf, right? We love bookshelves, uh, us math teachers, not for books, but for manipulatives. <laughs> so now you have your virtual manipulatives bookshelf that you guys can use. Just make a copy and add it to your collection. So just another way, a cre creative way of just, you know, showcasing information in a visual way. This might be a little oversimilar for some people, um, but, you know, right. just another example of how you can really transform and make it more, go from a traditional method into more of a digital platform. So think creative and think outside the box here and think about all the things you can do with images and, and icons and, and things like that as well. The toy theaters are amazing. I mean, they get these fraction pieces that click together and the kids can really kind of just get into different concepts without having to cut anything. I, I used to do fraction bars in my class. I'm like, even though we're cutting here, they just, they don't, they're not proportionally correct because the students have a hard time. Um, but yeah, you could do it all here with these virtual tools. So another thing I want to talk about is something I've been working on with um, Caps me, and it is basically a California partnership for math and science. And I know um, this was not intended for math and science, but a lot of people who maybe are joining are in those fields. Um, but it's not just for math and science. You can actually go and see this as an example as well. So what we've done is created units basically based on grade level and content level. So uh, again, the link is on there. So if you wanna navigate to there and check out this, this is a great uh, repository of information. Not only does it have information, but it also has other resources. Um, so this is another resource that I've created. Uh, this is just the first page of it, but if you click on it, it actually has some of those manipulatives that uh, we were just talking about. Uh, but it's also um, really uh, uh, how to, it's already built in, but it also talks about really clear instruction on how to implement the, the slides and other things in there. So it, this is not just a hyperdoc, this is kind of a hyper uh, unit lesson with very specific teacher instruction. Uh, so this is another way you can transform your, uh, whatever you're doing, this is for math and science. If, you, if you're in math and science, it's great to use and pull from this, this is a free resource, but also maybe if you're in a different subject, you can see how you can lay it out 
and kind of guide the learning on a digital platform. So there's other resources in here. This resource talks about all different types of, uh, not all of them, but some tech tools that you can incorporate into your lessons uh, around assessments, discussion boards, and student collaboration, things like that. So if you really want to know more about those things, I highly recommend you've got to go into check out those resources. There's other resources on that page as well besides technology support for distance learning. There's distance learning framework, there's ELL, there's uh, emotional learning, there's all kinds of resources on that. So it's not just for math and science, it also can apply for other things too. So that's another great resource that I've been working with um, as one of my consulting gigs that I've been doing. So it's a great resource for teachers to go in there and a lot of people don't know about it. So I'm trying to like, you know, promote a little bit. It's free, it's a great resource, go check it out all on Google. So you can copy lessons, you can edit them the way you want them. Um, and so go ahead and check that out as well. And make sure you check out the resources that are on there as well. Uh, let's see what else we have. Oh. So I just want to transition a little bit away from, you know, kind of the hyperdoc thing uh, into kind of more why we want to kind of, uh, why we uh, are talking about this and why this is so important. And one of those is that engagement factor. So, you know, having an interactive lesson really um, engages students. So taking things and making them more dynamic, uh, making them more user-friendly, visually accepting, uh, age-appropriate, you know, you spend more time on designing them, of course, but then that allows you more time to oversee things, interact. And Jen, Jen Roberts taught me this a lot. I mean, she does a lot of great stuff with Google Forms, and really guides learning because she has a lot of stuff already designed and what she's doing is just kind of being the mastermind behind the scenes She does all the stuff going on she's collecting data she's grouping students by by different levels uh where they're at in their projects all this fun stuff but really what it's doing is really enhancing that learning and you getting the power as the teacher as the kind of the guy behind the curtain, <laughs> you know, and controlling things. And right. that's really important, especially on online. So we're not just stuck on Zoom doing a passive thing. And that's kind of where this kind of happens. So, you know, making sure it's collaborative, you know, having those online activities, the discussion, the presentations, debates even. And I know, Patricia, you just had, you just did a um, uh, podcast with someone who wrote a book on debates. Yes, so he's awesome. <laughs> Um, so there's all kinds of fun stuff that we can really do to kind of transform our teaching from traditional into more of a, uh, a collaborative, more engaging environment as well. Well, I have to say that even before distance learning, um, I was using HyperDocs with my students in the classroom. And as you talked about the workshop style mode, uh, I always had a hard time with workshop because my kids were so diverse. And, you know, as soon as I sat down to work with one group, somebody's asking me a question. So I just never mm -hmm. could really get them to, to be independent. And so I introduced those hyperdocs and it was just magical. And if you've ever taught sixth grade, you know how crazy they can get, but it was, it really freed me up to do as you, you were talking about. to so actually look at the data to make, you know, those groupings and to kind of drill in and work work with students where they were at in a way that it was just so powerful and so much more effective. And I think for me, one of my hardest times was classroom management because, yep. you know, I was so busy trying to manage the class um, that I couldn't get the teaching done. So with the hyperdocs and typically, of course, it was my brightest and most gifted kids that were always driving me crazy. Um, I could create lessons that were at, in their zone of proximal development. So they were being challenged because that was really what it was coming down to was that they were being, they were just bored. So engagement is such a huge piece. And I really hope that you guys all got something from tonight. And, you know, when all is said and done, we go back into the classroom. I really think the teachers are going to keep bringing the technology in and transform the way they teach. Uh, another thing too is the asynchronous part. I think um, a lot of people struggle with this and um, are afraid to go asynchronous for a lot of different reasons, but really moves away from that passive lecture learning style. And like we said tonight, you know, giving them that that power of learning on their own speed, their own time, 
Um, I know it's hard to manage some of that, but using, make sure they submit screenshots. There's ways that really help, you know, asynchronous have them post on Flipgrid. So you can still do asynchronously, not so you have to abandon, you know, you still want to do face-to-face, -face, um, you know, do some meetings with students, but it really helps you kind of uh, push out content quickly and let students learn at their own speed as well. And just like you said, the high levels cannot be as bored um, and they're not sitting in front of a screen and doing a lecture for six hours all day long. Um, so that's just one thing I really like to talk about too within that, that how we can use technology to make more asynchronous student-centered learning uh, to really help with that and really try to balance that and, and making sure that all the students get uh, time and that all students are challenged at different levels. Uh, just quickly too, uh, to close with, I kind of one thing I just like to talk about uh, within, uh, you know, the online realm is, you know, creating that flexible time um, timetable for your students and for yourself. Uh, so that's why some of this, like using HyperDocs and really help transform your, your teaching instruction because you're really developing something that you can take and then you can take for next year and, and whatever, or your next unit, or, or however you're doing it, really creates that time and let students work on their own uh, time frame that they have. Um, and again, make sure you're engaging with the students, making sure that no one drops off. So making sure that you're watching, paying attention to students submitting things, making sure that they're uh, being present <laughs> online. And, you know, you can do that a lot of ways through discussion forums or uh, discussion board, uh, boards, however you want to do that. Uh, having them post something, like I use Flipgrid a lot, I think Flipgrid's a great resource. Uh, doing, even doing chat. So if they're on a document, go into their document, chat with them, how are you doing? Oh, I saw you made these edits, you know, maybe we should work on this. Even just kind of checking in with them, feeling that they're supportive and that you're there, you're aware of what they're doing is also important. Weekend check-ins, you know, making either that's um, uh, office hours or you just you know, have a, uh, a schedule that you let students, you know, uh, set time for you to check in and have them meet with you one-on-one -on -one, uh, or meet with the groups, also is good. Uh, making sure you're doing peer review activities. I know that's the hardest thing to do, but, um, they really help students really learn a lot from themselves and from other students. Um, and, and so there's a lot of research that backs that as well. So making sure that we're incorporating those. So there's a lot of things that you can do online that still incorporates uh, peer review activities. So I would, I would encourage you to investigate some of that. And it really help also with that is group work. So assigning group work, having them work uh, digitally using you know, Google Docs and sharing things. Uh, and having them work with, you know, different levels of students as well is also important. So just some things to think about um, with some of the stuff that we talked about tonight and how we can incorporate some of those into online learning. Anything else that you'd like to add? I think that's great. I, I'm curious what if people are having questions. I know we added a survey. We really want to hear from you guys. Um, if you want to, I don't know if that's on the next slide. Please give us your feedback. Let us know uh, how you're feeling in terms of your comfort with HyperDocs, what other questions you have, um, what else you'd like to learn about in terms of teacher professional development and things of that nature. So please, I will add this form to our chat, but there, was there any other questions that you guys had or things that you wanna ask about um, at this point in our session?